Guys, today's guest hails from the town I live in, from Bradford, PA, but he lives downstate now. And guess what? He is a renowned barber. And so, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about hair and what you should or shouldn't do with it. But mostly, we're going to talk about the things he's learned from the backside of the barber chair. This is the Manlyhood Mancast. Men, nobody but you can lead your family and yourself to greater things. Nobody but you can carve your path. It's time to rise up and be a man. Welcome to the Manlyhood Mancast with Josh Hatton. Hey, fellas, grab your calendars because we've got an event coming up that you do not want to miss. So October 28th, which is a Saturday of 2023, from 5 o'clock to 8, we are going to relax and smash right on Minor Run in Bradford, Pennsylvania. It's an axe-throwing place, and it's going to be our Manlyhood Season 7 launch party. We are celebrating the fact that we've been running for 10 years. We're celebrating that this is the launch of our seventh season, and we're celebrating over 700,000 downloads, well on our way to a million downloads. So get pumped for a killer night with hanging out with the guys, good times, and axe throwing. It's going to be great. So the folks at Relax and Smash are giving us a fantastic deal. Normally it costs 15 or 20 bucks if you want to throw. They're going to let us do it for five bucks a person. And there's going to be a food truck on hand as well. So if you want to throw some axes, grab some dinner, hang out with the guys and have a good time. That's what we're going to be doing on October 28th from 5 to 8 p.m. So yeah, it's going to be great. Bring your friends, invite your neighbors. Let's go party in style <laughs> so we can kick off this season seven of the manlyhood man cast. Uh, again, that's the manlyhood man cast season seven launch party. And it's happening on October 28th, 2023 from five to eight at relax and smash on minored run in Bradford, PA. Listen, even if you're from out of town, this is worth coming into town for because we're going to have a good time. So come join us and celebrate together. See you guys there. Gentlemen, welcome to the Manlyhood Mancast. Today's episode, we're going to be talking to a guy who is not just a barber, but a guy that listens to stories and walks people through life. You know, a relationship between a man and his barber is something special. So my barber, who lives here in town, I love going to see him, not just because he makes my hair look nice and I'm due for a cut. Uh, I'll be in touch, Mark, <laughs> but also because we get to have really good conversations. He does a lot of listening and he also does a lot of sharing and we have great conversations while he is holding a blade to my face, <laughs> uh, but he does good work guys. And there's something special about a barber and the relationship that he has with his clients. And so we're going to talk about that today with today's guests. Tate Yoey. Tate is also an author. He's written a book about his time as a first responder. And he is also going to talk about the things he's learned as the host of the Cherapy Sessions, uh, which is his opportunity to partner together with somebody where they started uh, just walking through life. It wasn't just about the haircut. It's about life. And he, anyway, he's doing phenomenal work. So uh, we're going to get right into this interview with Tate Yoey. Tate, it is great to have you on the show, man. Thanks for being on the Mainland Mancast. Oh, fantastic to be here. I'm glad we could finally like, link up on a time. Yeah, we've been talking about it for a while. So you're you're actually from this small town that I'm from, right? Aren't you from Bradford? Or Bradford, Bradford, Pennsylvania. Yeah, but but you live downstate now, right? Yeah, I'm in uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, yeah, Harrisburg. That's where all the bad stuff happens. <laughs> That's where all those guys yeah. that think they know what, what this part of the country needs, and then they just make bad decisions. But <laughs> It's quite a different, you know, four hours really makes a difference. It's incredible. Well, I mean, if you just go about half an hour in any direction, it's probably okay, though. 
Yeah, yeah, it's, it's better the further away from. The <laughs> oh, so Tate, uh, you are a barber, right? Is that what that's what you do? Correct. That's correct. I own my own barber shop uh, in a little town just outside of uh, Harrisburg, Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. So why don't you tell me about your shop? And I know there's a really cool history and story there with with that, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I've been barbering for eight years now. Um, and two years ago, I made the decision to buy my own shop. You know, there's like one of those events where like the stars aligned, everything was perfect. The universe literally dumped it right on my lap and I had no choice but to, to buy it. Um, and the funny thing is I've known about this shop for a long time and I never really even thought about like, oh, I could see myself working in there. Nope. But it wasn't until I walked into the shop that I realized like, oh, this, this is home. So the shop has a real rich history. It's a, uh, it's the oldest working barber shop in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. It's dated back to 1870 and it's been a barber shop ever since. Mm. I am the fourth owner of the barber shop. Um, its name is Nybert's Barbershop uh, because in 1928, Harold Nybert bought the barbershop and it became Nybert's. And that's what it's been ever since. And when I bought it, a lot of people asked me, you're going to change the name. And I thought, no way, this is this is like, I don't want to change a bad thing. Like It's been Nybert's since 1928. We'll leave it right where it's at. Was there an owner between Nybert and you or did you buy it from? Yes, there was one owner between Nybert and me. His name is Charlie. And he started cutting hair when he was 18 there and retired when he was 74. Wow. Yeah. Uh, is it a wood floor? This is a dumb question, but is it like a wood floor, like plank floor? Or? So the the subfloor, so it's laminate now, but the subfloor is a plank floor, yeah. I was just wondering, like, how much, like, if you were to, like, scoop down in between the boards and pull out the hair, like, oh my wouldn't God. that be crazy? So <laughs> what's interesting, uh, on, on my on my social media is there on Instagram, tate.the.barber, I have pictures on there of the shop from 1870 and it is virtually identical to how it looks now. The, uh, the mug racks that they used to hang in the shops still hang up there. The waiting room chairs is still the waiting chairs. You know, it's, the hat rack is still the same hat rack. Virtually nothing has changed. It's like a time machine. That's awesome. Do you have, uh, yeah. do you have a lot of the older clientele or do you have a pretty good mix of, of old and new? No, what was nice when I moved over there, a lot of my clientele came with me, but the, previous owner had a lifetime's worth of clients who started going to him when they were his age. So they're all older now and I had just absorbed his business. So I have a nice blended mix of um, anywhere from, well, my, my youngest client, probably eight months all the way up to my oldest client who's like uh, 98. So yeah, 98. That's amazing. Actually. <laughs> that's awesome. Do the, do the old guys like, like give you crap or are they like, are they cool with you? Uh, so when I bought the shop, obviously they'd been going to Charlie for a lot of years. So they were used to an, uh, an old man cutting an old man's hair. Right. And there was a lot of uh, uh, trepidation, standoffishness, maybe. Uh, this young kid, you know, can he cut hair? And then, you know, once I finally got him through a couple haircuts, everything was fine. <laughs> <laughs> everything was good. Yeah. yeah. No, nobody likes change, especially not not us, not a yes. farts, right? Yes. We don't like change. So, yeah. nope, nope, men, especially men, do not like change. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, for years, I had my wife cut my hair just because we were broke and she was good at it. And, uh, sure. and, and I didn't want to go to like a salon and have another woman cut my hair because as my wife was cutting my hair, it became quite enjoyable. You know what I mean? Like it was kind mm -hmm. of a little intimate moment. And, like yes. I didn't have an intimate uh, yes. moment with somebody else's wife, you know, and it just didn't feel right. So exactly. uh, I finally started going to a barber here in town and uh, I, uh, I see Mark Irvin and he works uh, with Matt Mills. I don't know if you know him. Is that in the Senate, old Senate yeah, building yeah. or Senate yeah. building? Yeah. yeah, they were on the ground floor. And then when they put the, the Maryland Horn Museum, they moved them up to the third third floor, I think. But I, I used to go to George's. Yeah. George Pascarello. Yeah, I think he's, I don't know if he's still there. The shop still says George's on I stopped in and saw him about a month ago when I was home. That's awesome. He's still in there. I said, George, you still come in the shop? He goes, yeah, I got to get away from my wife. So <laughs> he had a sign on his, uh, you know, the old sign that was up. And mm -hmm. he it was started to get all ratty and he tore it down. And uh, 
I, I drove by one day, you know, and it was like a big sheet of plywood, you know, and it had the vinyl letters on it, but it was all like yeah. tattered and the edges were all rotted. And I love antiques and old signs. And I drove by and I saw it and I'm like, I stopped him like, Hey, are you getting rid of that sign? He's like, yeah, I got a new one. I don't need it. I said, well, I said, can I take it? He says, I don't know. The mayor said he wanted it. I said, well, the mayor's my friend and he's not here. So I'm going to go ahead and take it if you're getting rid of it. He's like, okay, that's fine. So, you know, a few weeks later, the mayor came to visit me and he was like, Hey, uh, that's my sign. I said, no, it's not. It's mine. <laughs> and I had, and my wife hated it. She hated it. <laughs> and she would always complain about it. And the little more she, and my friends were like, when are you going to get rid of that? Your wife hates it. I'm like, the more she hates on it and complains about it, the more I'm leaving. I mean, it was the centerpiece in the living room, this big four by eight sign, you know? So that is fantastic. when I redid the living room, I gave the George's barbershop sign to a good buddy of mine and he's got it in his garage now. So that's awesome. Long, as long as it's safe. That's an iconic piece of history. George was actually a main reason that I went to barber school. Yeah. I, I grew up going with my grandfather to George's every weekend. And uh, when I went to barber school, like to, in, to like, check out the school, when I walked in, it was the smell of like the talc powder and the aftershave and all of that that comes with it. I was just, boom, transported back to George's Barbershop. And I thought, no, oh, this is it. I got to recreate that. That was because that was a pretty special time for me. That's awesome. I went to a, a barber uh, in Port Allegheny where I grew up with my dad quite a bit. Dad would always get a flat top. And so as a little kid, I'd get a flat top too because they were still kind of cool <laughs> in the 80s. Uh, yeah. But, um, and then then I tried to grow a mullet once and that was really bad. So they had to cut that off. But, um, and then, um, one time he took us over to Bradford and the shop is now gone, but it was sat over on mechanic street. Do you remember Did you ever go into that barber shop? What was it called? I don't remember. Cause I was pretty young, but I remember they had like lots of plants in the windows. It looked like a jungle when you Sunnies? might've been, I think it was, I think it was Sunny's. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, cause there was two barbers really in town, George and it had to been Sunny's. Yeah. Yeah. That was a pretty cool experience, you know, cause it wasn't the, the barber I was used to, you know, and going in and, you know, and you, you sometimes, you know, you go into a new shop and they look at you like you're crazy, you know, just cause you're not their regulars. And I just, remember sure, it sure. was fun, but yeah, I've always loved uh, in the smells of a barber shop, dude, like that's the best smell. What, what is that smell? Where's that come from? That, that is talc powder and aftershave and shaving cream. Huh? Well, it smells good. Fun. Little industry secret. You know the trees that you can buy, scented trees for your car? Uh-huh. They have a barbershop scented one, and it is exactly the way a barbershop smells. Sweet. So we should all get one and just, like, hide it so that we smell like a barbershop. Yes. Yeah, so, so there you go. There you go. That's awesome. Uh, you have the red and blue pole and everything outside the front door? Oh, yeah. Iconic. It's been that. The pole's been there since 1960. That's when they installed the pole. That's awesome. Does, now, do you... I'm assuming that because you've been a barber a while, like, what, is there a story behind uh, what what that means? Is there a symbolism with it, or is it- barber? Yeah, the barber pole. There is. So, uh, barbers were originally barber surgeons, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> and the reason that we were surgeons, like battlefield surgeons, is because we had sterile implements to do the work. Um, so that's that's how that started. Um, and one of the things that they believed was fixing people. They did it by bloodletting like swapping out a liter of blood and it was supposed to cure everything that, that ailed you. Uh, so you'd go to the barbershop and they would, uh, slice, slice your vein, let you bleed. And then they would take and they would wrap you with a white bandage until you stopped bleeding. And then they would hang those white. Once you, once you stop bleeding, they'd hang the white bandages outside to dry to reuse. And they would end up getting wrapped around this pole as the wind blew them. And that's where you got the red and white. And then later on, they added blue for the veins. That's where the red, white, and the blue come from. Well, now I know. That's there crazy. You go. So Thanks. you don't still do that stuff, obviously. No, 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 not at all. I'm always joking with my buddies, like when they're like, I got to have a surgery. I'm like, you know, I've butchered rabbits and chickens. Like, I know what inside. Oh, like, I think I could do yeah. this. And they all get mad and they're like, no. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> yeah, that's a, essentially the same thing. <laughs> so. Uh, I, you've also written a book, right? And it's not about barbering, if I'm correct, right? No. So, uh, so before barbering, uh, I worked as a EMT paramedic for 15 years. Uh, so I wrote uh, that was my COVID my COVID uh, adventure was writing that book because so I didn't I didn't work for three months. Uh, not, the barbershops weren't open, 
Um, so I wrote a book about my 15 years of working in EMS. Uh, what's and it's, that was a lot of fun. It was actually quite cathartic to just write it all down. What what uh what's the book called? Uh, it is on Amazon. Okay. So tell me a little bit more. Maybe tell me, could you tell me some of the stories of your time as an EMT? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one story that that people find quite quite uh quite incredible is uh, so we were dispatched one time for an expiration, which means somebody has passed away. And we have to go and confirm death and then take uh, responsibility of the deceased until they go to, like, the funeral home comes and picks them up. Because uh, believe it or not, someone, somebody has to be in ownership of that body at all times until they are laid to rest. So we go to this this house and the neighbors meet us outside. Mail's piled up on the door. You know, the, the whole, what you would say, like, we haven't seen Mrs. Smith in, like, seven days uh, so they let themselves in. They had a key, and they found her on the bathroom floor, and then called 911. So we go in, and the we find her on the bathroom floor. The lady had had a, a GI episode, and she checked her pulse. I mean, all things considered, this woman was deceased. Um, so I was writing some notes. Her head, her head was between laying between my legs, and her body was laying into the bathroom. And I'm, I'm writing some notes, getting ready to call the coroner because this just, it, it didn't sit right with me how this woman had passed. So I needed the coroner to come out and do an investigation for me. So as I'm getting ready to call the coroner, this woman takes a deep breath and grabs a hold of my leg. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my first thought was zombie, stomp her, but it didn't. <laughs> She'd actually, her, just her blood volume was so low that she was barely breathing and she didn't have a palpable pulse, but she was still, still alive. So with everything she had, she grabbed a hold of my leg to say like, I'm not dead. <laughs> and we got her to the hospital and she lived. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. That doesn't happen every day. Yeah. No, not every day. <laughs> no. How, how long did you say you did, uh, did that work for? Uh, 15 years. What made you decide that's what you wanted to do when you were doing that? Um, I know the, the cheesy saying is it was a calling. <laughs> There's lots of things that are callings. Uh, I grew up around medicine. My stepdad was a paramedic for Medic One in Bradford. My mom was a respiratory therapist. My grandmother was a nurse. My sister's an x-ray tech. Like, I've been submerged in it in my whole life. Um, like, I was reading his paramedic textbooks when I was in fifth grade. This is what I, that's all I've known. Um, so I just, I felt very compelled to go into the same the same career field. I was really drawn to the adrenaline of it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the excitement of that is what draws a lot of people, you know, to, mm -hmm. um, and then, so any other crazy stories you've got from, from, uh, from the saving life industry? Uh, yeah, I'm, I can, I, I have a, a cardiac arrest save. Um, so we went to a dialysis center one day for a, uh, patient having breathing problems. Um, and a lot of times, with, as the fluid gets taken off of the body at dialysis, sometimes people can have reactions to it, like shortness of breath and that kind of stuff. Uh, so we get there, and the guy's short of breath, and he's a larger man with one leg. Mm. So as we're trying to get him onto the stretcher, he says, I can I can stand up and sit. You don't have to pick me up. I'm, I'm large. And we're like, okay, you know, save my back if you can stand. So he stands and sits, falls over, cardiac arrest. Hard to stop. Uh, I do one compression on him, and he sits up and continues the conversation as if nothing had happened. But this, but by this time, his shirt was ripped. So he stops, and he's like, who who ripped my shirt? Like, he had no idea what had just transpired. Like, he died and came right back. <laughs> you didn't even get to sing the Stayin' Alive song with that one. I didn't. It was literally <laughs> one compression. <laughs> It was a, it was a fun and very rewarding career, mm -hmm. uh, but it was also it's also a very young man's career. And mm -hmm. I'm 38 now, and my back isn't as strong as it used to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that was the next question I was going to ask: is why did you get out of it? And and uh, you know, I I imagine it makes sense. You know, as you get older, you're like, okay, I'm not ready to be. It was time. I, I you know, I got into, I had some personal loss around the same time of working the EMS, and that's. That's hard when you have when you have a very tragic personal loss in your in your own life, and then you have to go to go to work, and manage other people's large losses. 
it's it's very difficult. And to anybody that can do it, my head is off to you. But for me, it was a a clear moment. I need to step away from this. And I took a I took a year off to sort out what I wanted to do in life. And it was one of the best decisions I'd ever made taking a year off of work. I did everything that I ever wanted to do, but just didn't have the time to do it. Like I, I was a I bar backed. I was a bouncer at a bar. You know, I did all these weird odd jobs just because they sounded like fun. And then I stumbled into barber school and that's how I, here I am. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I know a lot of guys go through, uh, the different points in their life that kind of go through that, that crisis of what do I want to do? Do I want to do this for the rest mm-hmm. of my life? And, uh, and, uh, and that can be a, a, a horrifying experience, but it can also be very rewarding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've got that. I mean, it was very scary coming out of barber school. I mean, you, you have to be a self-started motivated individual because you have no clientele. You are trying to sell the only product that you have, which is yourself. So if you don't have any confidence in yourself, you're not going to, you're going to see, you're going to sell yourself to somebody else if you don't even believe in yourself. So it's a, it's a real, uh, psychological, emotional gut check of, okay, you've got the talent, you've got the skills and the license to do it now, build your business. Yeah. Yeah. My daughter is actually, um, she is getting ready to go to cosmetology school for nails. So she's been doing, oh, nice. she's been, she's converted, a, uh, an old bedroom in the house to a nail studio and she's been practicing on, uh, friends and customers any any willing participants yeah and she's <laughs> yeah. really good really good. oh i was cutting my brother's hair with dog clippers before i went to barber school yeah. <laughs> yeah so she's she's ready to go like she's she's like i have a and she's you know the thing that's different about what like my kids have dealt with in life right like the everything they want to know is on the internet so mm-hmm. she's basically already gone to nail school <laughs> Yeah, she just learned it already. Yeah, yeah. so she's got she's just gonna go pay a bunch of money to prove she's learned it. So <laughs> it's a, it's a, you know Pennsylvania's got to get that money for that license. Yeah. that's what that comes down yeah, to. It's crazy. I think she's gonna go to New York and do a New York license, and then uh, she wants to set up shop uh, at the at Ellicottville because she figures. Oh yeah, money. that would be. Yeah, so that's what that's what her plan okay. is. That's what her plan is. But um, you know, and I I think that the cool thing about a business like that you know, whether it's barbering or really anything like that, where you're servicing people, like you get to, you you probably have a really, a lot of really awesome conversations. Oh man. Let me tell you. So the first, I've worked in two shops, (coughs) excuse me. The first shop I worked in was a five chair shop. And like, we would have good conversations with clients, but (coughs) there was always, you could always tell there's some reservations because there's five barbers in there. With, and if we're packed, there's five other guys sitting there. And, you know, you can get them to talk about some stuff, but most of the time it was pretty reserved. And what I found going to the shop that I have now, me being the only one in there, there's no depth to the conversations that I can get into in a, in a shop by myself. The things that men will openly share with me about life, about their mental health, about their their professional career, everything is just, it's incredible. Almost makes you wish you had a counseling degree to kind of go along with the barber school, right? Correct. Correct. (laughs) You're right. So why is it that you think that guys want to open up to their barber? It's safe. I mean, let's go back to what you said earlier. The haircutting experience is an intimate experience. You're letting somebody groom your hair. There's a level of trust that comes with that. Yeah, you can. And with that level of trust means you can be open with them about stuff. Yeah. So I think that I think that's why men feel pretty comfortable. I also think that men in general, especially in our culture today, don't have a lot of people they can trust or talk to. And so when somebody's willing to listen and you're kind of a captive audience in that moment, I think it kind of opens yeah. up the floodgates a little, you know? Oh, yeah. And I've, you know... Uh, I don't know if it's a side effect of the job, but you learn what things to to touch on or to talk about to get them to open up, you know, to, to engage in the conversation. <clears throat> what are uh, 
I mean, obviously, I don't want you to break um, barber patient confidentiality <laughs> if that's such a thing. But what are some of the stuff that um, that 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 your guys are dealing with? Well, one thing I can tell you with one hundred percent certainty is that all men are suffering. It's just in silence, and majority of men are too proud to talk about it. Hmm. And that in itself is the biggest, probably the biggest problem. Why do you think we're suffering? Ah, oh, there's so many, so many reasons. Um, like it could be loss of job, <clears throat> uh, money problems, relationship problems, uh, communication between uh, partners. That's usually a big one. Um, there's all, all kinds of things. But culturally, we're just expected to shoulder it and go on about our day. Yeah, that's and that needs to shift because it's it's okay not to be okay. Yeah, I would agree. I think I think the same thing that that everybody. Well, I have a couple mantras that I say a lot. I have a lot of them that I say a lot. But one of them is, first of all, everybody's crazy, right? Like, mm -hmm. like ever you know, like whenever you hear somebody like bragging about like a diagnosis for whatever mental health problem, and I'm always like, hey, look, we're all crazy here. We're all nuts. Yeah. So don't, you're not any more special than the rest of us. We're all nuts, but we're all a little crazy. We're all, a little crazy. <laughs> we're all crazy in varying shades and, and flavors. So, mm -hmm. but, um, but you know, within that it's, we're also all broken and we've all got problems and yeah. yeah. And, and nobody like, it's hard for men to, to like, even with my wife, who's my best friend, my confidant, mm -hmm. like, it was just, we've been married for 25 years. We just celebrated our anniversary uh, this month. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was just recently that I really understood what it meant to truly be open with her. The vulnerable, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, yeah. and, and, and I, I think that, you know, vulnerability is something that we don't have to be to everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. I do think we need to be authentic. You can be who you are. You can tell the truth. You don't have to hide things. You know, if someone asks you how you're doing, you can be like, oh, I'm not great today. And that can be the end of mm -hmm. it, but you can be real. Mm -hmm. But especially a wife, you know, especially your partner, yes. you, you know, and your wife, your, your best friend there, you, you got to be like, they need to see it. And and it was hard mm -hmm. for me to learn that. So it's, it's funny that you bring that up because I at one time had a client and, you know, he had told me, uh, very, very proudly that he had started in therapy. And, you know, I was giving him all the accolades, like, this is awesome. That's huge. J just you being able to admit that you needed some help is the, that's, that's the biggest hurdle. And he said, yes. You know, he explained to me what was going on in his life. And he was struggling with some addictions. And uh, he said, he, you know, he, he could tell his therapist things that he wasn't even comfortable opening up to his wife about. And I was like, well, I said, I think, I think there needs to be some vulnerability to your partner. Like she's chosen to spend her life with you and be vulnerable with you. And like, congratulations on the therapy piece, but also work towards having that vulnerability with your, with your partner as well. I know that like, uh, I'm thinking of the times where, where I've had those moments where I, I didn't even realize that I was hiding mm -hmm. the fact that I felt weak mm -hmm. or I felt ashamed or I felt scared. And, uh, you know, and I, I think in general, a lot of guys might even be hiding it from themselves because I don't think we yeah. always fully understand or have the vocabulary to explain it or put it into words. Yeah. My, my girlfriend and I call it the, the gentle call out. So like, cause we're very good at recognizing that, uh, one of us is in some sort of a funk or an energy or something. And we'll just we'll just gently pull on it until they open up about it. Um, and it, and it helps because it helps us not to just sit in it, but they're going to help us with it as well. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. To be able to say, "Hey, look, something's going on. What is it?" And mm -hmm. yeah, you know. And I think I think it's a it's an important part. And I'll be honest. Sometimes sometimes she's like, uh, "I don't want to talk about it right now." And I have to I have to respect that, mm -hmm. give her her space because I know and I trust that when the time is right, she will come to me with what she needs to talk about. She will be vulnerable and open with me about what's really on her mind. And that's a hard one, too, to trust that they will come back to you when they say, give me a minute. I just need this space. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, uh, I know that with me, like I'm, I'm always, uh, I, I think I will tell myself that I'm fine mm-hmm. and I'll convince myself that I'm fine. And, but are you? and, I, and I'm sometimes I'm not. And okay. so I'm, I'm, I've convinced myself that I'm fine. And then I don't have to think about the fact that I've mm-hmm. got some anxiety about something. I don't have to think about the fact that I'm angry about something. Although anger, anger is the one that we men can get away with for some reason. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so like if I'm, if I'm hungry or if I'm lonely or if I'm scared, it probably just looks like anger. <laughs> well, you know, I can, the one thing that I have, I have found out and, I, and I'm ashamed that it's taken me 38 years to figure out is that anger is not actually an emotion. It is a reaction mm. to an underlying emotion. And when you can, when you can abstract the anger from what is really going on, it is life altering because you no longer have to sit in anger. I was a very angry person for a long time. And to be able to remove the anger from, from life and figure out, oh, okay, I don't have to be angry about this. I can just deal with it. <laughs> Tate, I think that would be a really good thing to maybe expound upon a little bit if you don't mind getting kind of personal with us. Do you, can, can yeah, you have no an problem. example of a time where anger was at the surface, but there was something else, maybe a, a real per- a story to help us really understand it? Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm only going to speak on my, my behalf. So this may be different for, for other men, but like when I'm feeling strong emotions, uh, anger or other words, I do some self-talk to, cause everybody, everybody has a, a, a child that lives inside them. It's, it's your own child that, that is you. And talking to that child, I will say like little Tate, what really is the, the problem here? And uh, like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, Uh, like my girlfriend was going away and like she goes away at the same time every year. That's never changed. Uh, She goes to church camp and I just found myself getting angry about it. Like when she would go, I'd get really angry about it. Um, And my first thought was, you're just angry because she's not here. And and I'm like, no, that's not the case. That's dumb. Why would I be angry? Because she's not here. She's coming back. Um, And when I stopped and talked to little Tate that lives inside me, like, Remove the anger. I said, what are you upset about? And then little Tate was upset that she wasn't coming back. He was worried that she wasn't coming back because I have my own abandonment things to worry, to work through for my childhood. Uh, So once I was able to identify, like, listen, self-talk, little man Tate, she is coming back. She's just going away to camp for a while. She's coming back and everything's going to be okay. We're going to love you through this and everything's going to be fine. And that was that the anger had been removed and I was no longer angry with her going to camp. I like that idea of anger, not being an emotion, but rather the symptom of the emotion. Yeah. And uh, that's good. I think that's a really good example to help understand it because, you know, I I know that that happens to me a lot where um, like there's a, there's a stressful thing going on. We're getting ready for company coming over and I've got a lot of prep work to do. I've got to do the dishes or I've got to do this and that. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm getting really grumpy and I'm getting snippy with my wife or with my family or whoever. And uh, it's hard what? to stop and think and process like, why am I angry? What am I actually angry yeah. about? And I think when I really think about it, it's not that I'm angry that I have to do the dishes. It's that I'm angry Maybe that I have to rush because I didn't do them earlier <laughs> or whatever. You know? Maybe there, there's a, there's a piece of anxiety underneath it. Like I have to get this stuff done right now. Mm-hmm. So there, so you're feeling a little anxious about it and that can come out as being angry or snippy with people. Right. I, I encourage guys when we talk about like emotions and that kind of stuff in the barbershop, I encourage them to don't be so quick to, to go right to words when you're angry. Take five seconds really ask yourself, what are you angry about? Like, ask yourself, talk it through. What are you angry about? Take that time. And because nothing good comes from being angry and then trying to communicate through anger. If anyone's ever tried to do that, you know, it it is not good. So when you have these conversations with the guys in the chair, do they, Mm -hmm. um, 
are they open when you're giving them advice? Like, it is, do they like that? It's it's fun to watch the light bulb go off. It's 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 it, you can almost see it happen instantly. They just like their whole posture changes. Like, huh? I never thought about that. Like one of my favorite things is they will replay conversations that they may have had with their partners, and you know how it made them feel angry. And I will just kind of flip it around and say, well, did you think about what she's actually saying and what you're not hearing? And then I would kind of tell them what she is saying. Like, here's what she's saying. And you see them go, huh, huh. And I guess I wasn't seeing what she, I wasn't hearing what she was saying. Do you have those conversations with the old guys too? Or just, or, or I can picture the young guys. Being oh, open no. To that. <clears throat> yeah, no, no. The young guys or the older guys, it's, it's actually quite adorable. The older guys are very, almost subservient to their wives. Um, They've been through all the wives, They're done. They're like, I'm checked out. <laughs> yeah. the, the wives are, they are the object of their affection and whatever they need, they get. Like, though they will kind of be like, my wife said that she would like my hair a little shorter today. Oh. You got it. Whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I would say that too, definitely. I think, uh, I think that the older that I get, right, the more I appreciate my wife. Yeah. So I, I can see that. Like, imagine, I can imagine, you know, I'm 45 now. So I imagine if I was 70 if mm-hmm. that long. Yeah. I'm probably going to appreciate her quite a bit. Whatever she wants, yeah. she's got. She's put up with me all these years. She I, deserves it. So <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest. I, I don't have any children of my own, but my girlfriend has two children. And it wasn't until I started dating her that I was, I really understood that women are the most incredible humans ever. <laughs> I mean, men, we have it hard, but what women go through, oh, like it's, it's rough. Like they, they really toe the line. Yeah. Well, and you know, I, I think that there are a lot of things that women go through that I don't think men understand. Like I, I've had some conversations yeah. with ladies lately about, uh, like the creepy men that they encounter. And the, you know, and I'm like, dude, like, first of all, like, I do think that like, okay, so if I'm a a pretty girl at a bar, right. And, uh, an attractive man comes up to me and hits on me and I enjoy it. That's one thing. And if the guy comes up to me and he looks like me, right. (laughs) Looks like I look, you know, then I don't enjoy it so much. Then it's harassment. So I get that there's a little bit of that going back and forth. Right. But at the same time, like, like, like dick pics, why in the world are people randomly sending out pictures of their genitalia to women? <laughs> like, yeah. Like, when did that become a thing? Like, exactly. Like, like when, in socially in, and ever, like who in anybody's right mind thought, you know, what would be a really great idea? <laughs> You know, what's, what's funny is I didn't think about how bad it was. And then when I started my dating, uh, Lauren, she, the, one of the first things she said to me was like, please, please don't send me a dick pic. And I was like, uh, is that, is that a thing? And she was like, yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, I, um, yeah, I, I, like I get messages from like, I don't know if they're bots or if they're Nigerian scammers all the time on Instagram that are like, you know what I mean? You know those yeah. messages. They're like, hey, hey, you're handsome. Do you want to talk? And sometimes I'll mess with them. You know, I'll send them like, yeah. like I'll just spam them with a thousand memes just to see what they do. Uh, I never have inappropriate conversations with them. But I like sometimes I'll just like see. I'm trying to get the person to crack, you know. The other day I spent half an hour telling a girl that she needed to repent and turn to Jesus. That was fun. Um, that was- <laughs> and then she stopped talking. So, um, but, you know. Like, I think that if a guy were randomly to get a boob pic, right, it's going to be a completely different reaction for most men than it would be. Like, we want to see that, right? Women don't ever want to. See that. Women don't want. Women don't want to see that. No. <laughs> Especially not without permission. You know, like no, no, no thank you. No, thank you. Uh but, and, and I'm not here to bash men. Like, obviously I think the vast majority of men are smart enough to know that. I think there's just a few troglodytes out there that are just stupid. You know? <laughs> there, there are some of there that just, they just won't get it. They just won't get it. 
Besides, we already know that Kyle at the NSA is looking at it. So, I mean, yeah, exactly. I don't want him seeing my junk, you know? I'm not... Thank you, Patriot Act. <laughs> oh. So, uh, I I remember you did a series of videos, I think, called Cherapy, right? Is that? Yeah. So, <clears throat> you're good, good memory. Uh, so, the idea came about because I realized that men were willing to open up in my barber chair uh, to things that they normally wouldn't probably talk about in day-to-day life. And I was playing around with the name of it, and I was like, yeah, it's kind of like therapy, but it's in the barber chair. We call it therapy. And <clears throat> the concept came out of uh, bringing people in um, in a closed shop setting and just setting up a video and letting them tell their story uh, of, of who they are, what they do, difficulties in their life because I was just fascinated with the stories that some of my clients were telling me and and what came about was probably the most incredible thing I've ever done um, I ended up it ended up getting sponsored by you financial mass mutual wow. they sponsored 10 episodes and uh, we had a blast with it an absolute blast we interviewed um, a veteran a firefighter an EMT a police officer a dispatcher um, and then a handful of others who, who had no affiliation to like services. Um, but hands down, my favorite, hands down, my favorite guy, George. Oh, love George to death, right? George's history, he did 17 years in and out of federal prison for drug distribution manufacturing. Um, and his story of getting himself straight, clean, and, you know, on the right path was, it was just so humbling to me. And to, to give you a little snippet of it, uh, he wears these uh, sandals. He wears these slides every day, just plain black slides. And I said, why do you wear them slides every day? Like, they are beat to hell. And he's like, oh, these are the first slides, I, my last slides I got in jail. And I wear them every day to remind me where I don't want to go back. Mm. And I was like, I, I need to tell this man's story. I need to tell this man's story. Are those available anywhere for people to watch if they want to? Yeah, uh, you can you can go to YouTube. Uh, it's under Cherapy Sessions, yeah. and you can find all ten episodes there. I, I did it with my the help of my my partner Will. He shot and edited everything. It was an absolute masterpiece what he was able to do. <clears throat> we should you should take a vacation up here to Bradford, and uh, we'll sh- we'll we'll shoot like a bunch more of them, dude. I got a bunch of guys that would be great for that. So. That'd be a lot of fun. That'd be a lot of fun. As we, as we kept going with it, what's that? We should do season two. We'll make it happen. Absolutely. Well, so we were, I mean, we have season two ready to rock and roll. Uh, we are just shopping sponsorships currently. Oh, that's awesome. So the, the plan is to keep this going. I mean, we'd love to, to be able to get it maybe picked up by a streaming network somewhere eventually. So that's my, that's my, that's my baby. We're going to keep going with it as long as awesome. we can. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Uh, you know, and I, I love the idea that, you know, people trust you, you know, well, first of all, you're a great guy anyway. Like, I think like if you weren't cutting people's hair, I think people would be open to you. Like, just because you're, you're approachable, you're, you're honest, you tell it like it is like, that's a good thing, you know? Yeah. But there's something about when a guy's got a blade to your head. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, Yeah. I mean, some of the things that have been talked about in the shop, I mean, I had one guy uh, basically told me his, his whole suicide attempt the day before he'd come in for his haircut, he, but he couldn't go through with it. Like, like pulled it right out there, like, hey, this is what I was doing yesterday, and I almost, I almost went through with it. Man, did he get some help, do you know, or? Uh, I believe he, he is in the process of getting some help, but it was, it was, it was kind of beautiful because I was the only person that he felt comfortable mm. talking to about it. You know, that right there, like when you look at the numbers of the leading causes of death for men, mm-hmm. like suicide and addiction, which is just slow suicide, mm-hmm. you know, that's the leading causes, man. And the other causes are often can often be related to those same things, you know, because we don't deal with our crap and then our crap deals yeah. with us, you know, and that's not good. Societal, societally, it's not cool to talk about that stuff. Yeah. Well, and given you don't want to 
it, it might not be good to tell everybody everywhere, you know, because uh -huh. you can make a mess, unfortunately, but it is the, the truth. But you got to talk to somebody. But we, we can start affecting change generationally <clears throat> by talking to our kids, nieces, nephews, <clears throat> and being open emotionally around what you're feeling, like showing them that it's okay to to express this stuff. And then change begets change begets change. Yeah, you know, I, I was actually just having a conversation with somebody yesterday. And we, were, <clears throat> we were talking about the fact that people want change right now <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. and and they're like you know the world's a mess look how messed up it is well the change that's that we're seeing right now while it might seem rapid it's been happening for generations to get us to this point and it's going to take some generations to get us back to a place mm -hmm. and, and when i say back i mean i'm not saying we have to go back to the good old days i think we need new old days you know mm -hmm. we need or, or good new days or whatever you call it but you know for us to change, like it's probably not going to be your generation that is the, the, it's going to look ugly for a while, you know? Yeah. It's my, it's my 13 year old nephew's generation. And it might be his kids yeah, that really see the difference and the seeds. Yeah, we, I'm not going to be here to say it. The seeds we, however, I can plant this. Yeah. I was going to say, you can plant this, we can plant the seeds, but we're not going to be here to see the fruits. You know, it's funny cause, um, you know, I, I, I follow a lot of different, men influencers just to kind of see what, what they're doing. And, you know, there's some who are, they love to preach how bad toxic masculinity is. And then you have some who are like, Oh, you think that's toxic. You just sit still and wait and see. <laughs> and, you know, and it's funny. Cause like, like the real people like us, you know, when we talk about it, it's like, I don't like the words toxic masculinity. And that's just because I think they, the words, what they end up doing is people, I just associate masculinity with toxic instead of understanding the point yeah. of what it is. But the point of what it is, is the fact that culturally men can't share their problems that, and get the help they need. You know, that's a part, yeah. you know, that men send pictures they shouldn't be sending on the internet, you know, like, like that concept exists. I just wish it did. Ha I wish we just called it toxic, <laughs> you know, yeah. instead of toxic masculinity. So we didn't dirt toxic, toxic behavior. Yeah. It's just toxic behavior, but it's yeah. the truth. Like, like I'm not saying we all need to go around crying all the time, but we also need to, you know, clear the barrel a little bit and, and, and make sure we can think clear headed and be healthy. And that takes talking right. about the crap. Yeah. Absolutely, like being able to own it, just put ownership to your your things and talk about them. Tate, you talked about how uh, George the barber here in town was an influence for you in wanting to become a barber. What kind of influences were in your life um, when it comes to being a man? Oh, my dad for sure. My dad still lives in town. Uh, big ups, eight one four. <laughs> corner of state street and interstate parkway that's been my dad's house my entire life um and the the characteristics that he instilled in me from a very early age will carry me carry me along forever um he first and foremost he was he was a father to me and that meant coming home from a 12-hour day and going outside and playing catch that meant coming to my baseball games that meant you know, just doing stuff with my dad. Um, <clears throat> this might get me emotional. My dad, I found out last year my dad is terminal with ALS. And um, so we're working through that together. So talking about my dad might get me emotional. So I apologize up front. But Hey, pause. Uh, you don't ever have to apologize for being emotional, right? <laughs> you're right. You're right, because it's okay. It's okay to be emotional. Yeah. Uh, so he owned in town, he owned his own uh, carpentry business called the carpentry, uh, down on main street there. And the first things that I learned about him is that there's only a few things that you are given as a man that you're born, born with, uh, your word and your work ethic are two of the biggest ones. And if you give someone your word, you have to keep that. Like, that's it. Like you are only as good as your word. And the man's work ethic, I mean, he worked from sunup to sundown, sick, cold, tired. He worked and he provided. 
And that that carried me. That's that is the ingenuity right there that got me past that first year of barbering. That was the hardest when you have to build your business from the ground up. I would think back to like my dad and like growing his business, and he never gave up on it. He he believed in himself first. So I'll, I'll always have that um, that piece of him. And he, he was he was great with me and my sister. He's just a wonderful man. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think people don't realize how powerful a father figure is in somebody's life. And, mm-hmm. and that's a, that's an awesome thing to have a good dad. And I, a lot of the guys I talk to don't have what you and I had in, in having a good dad like that. And so mm-hmm. my dad always used to tell me he's being, you know, not everybody has a, a mother and father that love each other and that love you, you know, and I didn't understand it until, you know, I started to recognize that's why a lot of my friends or classmates might be a better word than friends, but why a lot of my classmates acted the way they did because they didn't have anybody playing ball with them in the yard or teaching them how to box or, you know, the stuff that our dads did, you know? I I had much more of an appreciation for my dad as I became a older man. Um, My parents divorced when I was very young, like four, and, you know, there's not a lot of memories that I have about the divorce, but as I got older and was comfortable with talking to my dad about things, and he was comfortable opening up about things, it became very apparent to me how hard that divorce was for him and how much he sacrificed for me and my sister. To the sacrifice of being, of like, um, I would like to come see this, see you do this thing or go to this place. However, your mother and I cannot get along. And if I show up, it's going to distract from what you're doing. So he's going to sit maybe out at center field instead of setting up at where I could see him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, things like that. I, I never understood how much he really sacrificed for us after the divorce. I think it's awesome that he made a point to explain that to you too and to do what he could to still be there for you because a lot of dads just give up. You know? Well, yeah, and I, I'll never forget the conversation. And it, you know, Full disclosure, I, I have been in weekly therapy since 2015. And it was the greatest decision I ever made in my entire life. And it, and it pushed me to have those awkward conversations with my parents that I, that I otherwise would not have had. And one of the biggest questions I had from my dad was, how come I never saw you at things when I was growing up? My concerts, band, I was in marching band, sports, and that kind of stuff. And my stepmom went upstairs and she came down with a, a photo album just stacked full of like newspaper clippings and everything. And you know, that's when they explained to me, like they went to all the things but to avoid the conflict, they chose to remain in the shadow, hmm. take photos of me, put together the photo album, but they just didn't want to draw away from the attention that was given there for me. Yeah, that's awesome. That's powerful. Yeah. So then, and that, that really was a turning point in me and my dad's relationship. We, we instantly became closer because of that. Hmm. You talk about... Uh you know, you mentioned being in therapy, you know, for that time frame. what are some of the most valuable things that you've learned in your process of getting, you know, well, my process of therapy is nobody is responsible for my emotional maturity, except for myself. That is it. The buck stops with me. It's not, it's not my partner's responsibility to regulate my emotion. It's not my family. It's not my friend. I have to be in control and responsible of my own emotions, which means having uncomfortable conversations with myself and really doing some self exploration as, as to, you know, why things trigger me the way they do or why this makes me sad or that kind of stuff. Mm. I, it's funny cause I know a lot of people who, who maybe get bad therapists and they, it, it all just becomes about, you know, like I understand that we have to process our past, like that's part mm-hmm. of the process. But a lot of times they just get stuck in blaming mom and dad for all the things that mm-hmm. happened when I was a kid, when they were a kid. And so it's it's actually really cool to hear that that ownership. You know, like and you know, like I got I I know that not all therapy is bad. Like I don't mean to say it in that way. Mm-hmm. I think most of it's good. But every now and then you see that person, and maybe it's not the therapist. Maybe it's the person right? They, they get, they yeah. face the trauma and they camp there, you know, and that's not, that's not. Well, true. 
I was very fortunate. You know, I, I saw like three therapists before I met Deb, the lady that I've been with. And they, we just, they weren't bad therapists. We just personality wise weren't good fits. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to recognize like, okay, this person and I aren't going to be a good fit for deep conversation, but it doesn't mean all therapists are going to be bad fits. You just have to keep trying them out. And thankfully, you know, I found Deb and we've been on the path ever since. That's awesome. That's awesome. Right. Well, Tate, I like to ask all my guests a few questions and I know we've talked, we've talked a little bit about some of this stuff. So, uh, that's okay if there's some repeat, but I still want to hear your thoughts on it. What does it, take, okay. what does it take to be a man? Oh yeah. So I, I did, I took some notes. Good. <laughs> uh, I'd like to go back to like the things that my dad instilled in me. What does it take to be a man? Uh, um, you know, your, your word and your work ethic and how you treat others and all that little stuff. But bigger than that is the, the owning of your own emotional maturity. Um, being able to have big emotions and big feelings, but harness them, that is more powerful than throwing a fist or getting in a fight or drinking until you're black out drunk. You know, anything that is a, that you use as a coping mechanism, just learn to own your own emotional maturity. That is, that is the strongest thing you can do as a man. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think it's good stuff, man. Thank you. All right, Tate, let's say we can hop in Marty McFly's DeLorean <laughs> and we can roll back, what, about 18 years, I think, mm -hmm. and, and talk to 10-year-old Tate. Mm -hmm. What are you going to tell him? You know, I've been thinking about this all day because there's so many things that I would tell him, like lotto numbers, <laughs> like who who wins the World Series, like all kinds of things. Um but in, in the simplest form, I would tell him, it only gets better. That's it. Like, it only gets better. Keep going. Um, I've had many points in my life where I was like, I, I can't do this anymore. Like, I can't do it anymore. I'm done. Now, you know, when I was 18, I had you know, my first suicide attempt because I didn't know how to process emotions and, and deal with them. Uh, so if I if I could talk to the little man Tate at ten years old, I would tell him to just keep going because it only gets better. Hmm. It's powerful, man. Well, I'm Thank you. I'm glad that you that you failed at eighteen because it's been <laughs> because it's been cool to yeah. know you. So yeah, thank you very much. Me too. So uh, the next question is: What is your best advice for the men that are listening today? Ooh. I was thinking about which way I could I could take this question. Um, the first answer I would say, communicate, 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 and then over communicate, because ninety nine percent of the conflicts or, or can all be related back to miscommunication. That is probably the biggest thing I've drawn from chatting with my clients in the barbershop is whether it's a, a you and your spouse or you and your friend or you and a family member or your parent or communication is the biggest thing um, and you don't have to be good at it. You just have to be open to it. Um, what else would I say that sometimes you have to open your ears and close your mouth because you're not hearing what people are saying and which goes back to communication. Yeah. Communication involves listening and speaking, right? And speaking. Yes. Yes. So, Unrelated, but kind of related, since you are okay. a barber, how do how should you communicate with your barber about how you want your hair? Oh, excellent, excellent question. Okay, so if I have a, a new client that comes in, <clears throat> first question I'm going to ask them is, how often do you get a haircut? Because that's going to tell me exactly how how long or how short they like to take it, how much they like to get cut off every time they come in. Um, like, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm speaking on behalf of like a client who has no idea how to describe what they want. Mm -hmm. So then you can ask them like, well, how would you like the sides of your hair? Do you like it to be able to be combable? Do you like it less than combable? Skin, no skin, you know, that kind of stuff. So really the responsibility falls on me to walk you through what I'm, what I'm trying to interpret you want your hair to look like. <laughs> so go to a good barber who 
who's going to ask you these questions or go to a good hairstylist. I won't even be specific with a barber, just someone who's a hair person and be open to let, letting them ask you questions. That's one of the things that we're taught in school is to ask the questions to walk through the haircut. Um, and if you're happy with what you have, ask the questions like, oh, what, what blade did you use on that? I like that, that length. So then you know when you go in again, I like a two on the side. There's another option. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, what should I do in between haircuts to keep my hair like the way it needs to be? Like any recommendations for product or how to style it myself in the meantime? Sure. <clears throat> I, um, the look, I mean, obviously without, without seeing your hair, if you have a person who has lighter, thinner hair or like finer hair, you want to avoid heavy pomades. <clears throat> this is going to make your, it's going to make you look even thinner than you already are because they're very heavy products. You want to use something that's like a paste or a matte, something with a matte paste or finish or a cream that's going to, or, or even better, they have sea salt spray. Sea salt spray works wonders. Um, so finding the right product for your hair is probably the first thing. Um, and then you go from there. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I just thought, you know, hey, let's ask some barber questions while we've got you. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. Most people have beard questions. Like, what do I do with my beard? Well, there you go. How about let's ask that. What should I do with my beard? Uh, so a lot of men have questions around beard balm, balms versus beard oils versus beard creams. You know, when should I apply this? When should I do this? General rule of thumb is uh, beard oil is wonderful for itchy beards, dry beards. They moisturize the hair. Um, beard creams or beard balms are more for control. Think of it like if you were going to style your hair so it didn't move throughout the day, you would use those products to put it in your beard so it stays the way it's supposed to look and doesn't like fly around. So they're more, that's the easiest way to, to describe for it. those those ones. Yeah. Like I, I don't use any beard balm products because my beard's not long enough that I need something to hold it in place. Just the beard oil for me works. Yeah, just to lubricate it a little bit and make it smell nice. Yep. And wash. Wash your face. That's the biggest one. Wash your face. Yeah, I, I saw a thing that said that like uh like men's beards like have like all kinds of bacteria and fecal matter and oh, sure. and I'm like oh, I I would believe that, you know, by food, and that, you know, all the things that our faces come in contact with. But yes, <laughs> wash your face, get your hands in your beard, scrub the skin, exfoliate the skin. So take good care of it. <laughs> take good care of it, exactly. I will be in town the first weekend of September. It's my 20-year high school reunion. Ah, well, <laughs> let's get together when you're up, man. That'd be awesome. So yeah, I'll be up that weekend. I'll shoot you a message. Sounds good. That sounds good. Well, Tate, I really appreciate you being on the show, man. If guys want to connect with you uh, to check out the the therapy sessions that you've got done, or if they want to check out your book, uh, so we're, we'll make sure we put a link in the show notes. So they go to Amazon for the book. Look up Tate. Yeah, you can go. To, you can go to Amazon. I just type in my name, Tate Yoey, um, and it'll bring bring up my book, First Line of Defense: My Life as an EMT. Uh, you can also check me out on Instagram. It's probably where I'm the most active. And that's tate.the.barber. And there's a link to my book there. They can reach out, message me. I can communicate with them. We can see pictures of the barbershop. Yeah, I, that's my favorite part. I love the I love the mug rack. I think that's the coolest thing. Yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, I'll make sure to link all that stuff in the show notes too. So if you guys want to connect with Tate, uh, just click through and you can check out his stuff. So, dude, I really appreciate this conversation. It's been much needed and for a while we've been talking about it. So I'm glad we can make it happen. This has been a blast. Thank you for having me on. So I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thanks man. Tate, one of these days I'm going to hop in a car and drive downstate so I can uh, get my hair cut by you and check out your, your awesome barber shop, man. I so appreciate you being on the show with us today. Uh, I love it when I can interview somebody who is from this area uh, because there's, it's so cool. We have a different connection when you grow up in a small town like this. And uh, yeah, it's awesome, man. So thank you again for being on the show. Guys, if you want to check out the work that Tate's doing, if you want to check out the book he's written or anything else, guys, check out these therapy sessions he's recorded. Uh, make sure you click the show notes and scroll down there. You can find those links there as well. Tate, again, thank you. Those of you guys who are listening, just want to encourage you, be real with people. Tell them the truth. When they ask you how you're doing, be real. And be patient with other people when they're real with you because really we just need more people to actually care about each other 
in order for this w- world to work, most of the time all we think about is what's happening on this side of our face. So let's be real. Let's not put on the masks. Let's care. I love you. I'm proud of you. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Manlyhood Mancast. If you want to be a better husband, father, leader, a better man, you need to join our private Facebook group, the Manlyhood Man Cave. Join today. Please help us out with a like, comment, share, and subscribe. And check us out at manlyhood.com.